Uh, okay, Kate, do you have another speaker for me? We do. We have Jamal Ch Chandler on. Hey, Jamal, how you doing? What's up, John? How are you? Thanks for having hey. me on again. Hey, things are happening here at Mad Hedge Fund Trader. We've got all these great speakers lined up, including yourself. Go ahead and get your screen up, and I will give them your introduction. Okay. Uh, Jermal Chandler is a co-host of The Leap from Options to Futures, which follows an option trader's foray into futures trading. Additionally, he provides weekly trading insights on the options jive segment via Tasty Trade Live. Before arriving at Tasty Trade in 2021, Jamal was educating investors on the utility of equity options as a senior instructor of market insights in the CBOE Options Institute. His career began at Peak Six Capital Management, where he traded volatility arbitrage portfolios in the dynamic hedging group in the Peak Six Advisors Hedge Fund over an eight year period. Jamal also spent time on the regulatory side of financial markets. He worked in the market regulation group at FINRA as a regulatory investigator at the CBOE. Uh, both appointments involved working with SBX and VIX market makers and brokers. Uh, and Jamal, you're broadcasting from the windy city of Chicago, I believe. Yes, sir, I am. And uh, thank you for that uh, read off of my past. I've definitely had an eclectic past to say the least. <laughs> well, get another, add another 50 years and you'll catch up with me. <laughs> so uh, anyway, these are great educational presentations that Jermall does. Obviously he's a seasoned market pro, so he knows what he's talking about. And he has a unique uh, perspective of uh, 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 having been on the regulatory side also. So Jermall, you have until five minutes before the hour where we hand out our next batch of prizes. And uh, anybody wants to type in a question for Jamal, uh, just type it on the right uh, and um, he will address it directly. So Jamal, you have the floor. Thanks, John, appreciate it. Uh, good morning, everyone. Welcome and uh, glad you are here with us on a Monday. It's March already, and we just changed time. Um, I'm I'm actually glad to say this feels like the first time in probably 20 years. I'm not. I don't feel like I'm hit by a Mack truck on the morning after uh, we, or I should say, the Monday after we we changed time. Feeling pretty good today. So hopefully, uh, I can entertain you a little bit and and give you some interesting stuff in this this absolutely crazy trading environment that we find ourselves within these days. Um, I, it sounds like you've already had a couple of speakers this morning. Many of you are probably in the markets pretty regularly, so you're aware of what's going on. But I, um, I, like, to, I like to talk via graphs. I love graphs. Uh, the other weird thing about me, I should say, in, in some regard, I call it weird because it's very non-traditional. I have a background in engineering and science, and that was my background for 10 years before I even came into trading. So I um I like charts is really what I'm getting at. And so a lot of these I'm going to go through the day. I mean, they're pretty straightforward, but I like to show what's going on in, in pictures. Um, I'm a very visual learner. And maybe some of you are, too. And um, from there, we're going to get into some of the trading ideas. I'll go into our platform, the Tastyworks platform, um, which we have. I think a lot of people can can get confused between the two. I know I did when I first started at Tasty Trade. I wasn't aware of there's a difference. But Tasty Trade is our financial network where we provide um, for more than eight hours a day, this free content on trading and a lot, you know, a lot of it we do with a you know different personality as well. And then we have Tasty Works, which is our trading platform. So, like I'm sure many of you have other trading platforms you use, maybe something you know from Fidelity or or, or um, from you know TD Ameritrade, or whatever we have, which we feel is the best platform. It's uh, Tasty Works, and so I'm going to go into that platform later on and show you. Um, some ways we can capitalize some of the trades of some of the things that we talk about today. So this is uh, where we're going to talk about finding option trades for the current macro environment. So quick start off. Um, obviously, the S&P 500 has struggled for direction. We have a myriad of issues that have contributed to this challenging trading environment. Now, the interesting thing is if you've paid attention over the last couple of months, we have a strong labor market. And even if you haven't paid attention to that, 
maybe you're lucky enough, um, you know, to the people you interact with, people aren't really necessarily complaining about their jobs as much. Now, that's a broad brush stroke, I know, but it's fairly, fairly true um, because of the environment that we just came out of after the pandemic. Most job places are looking for the top talent and they are trying to keep that top talent happy. And that has created this environment where uh, there's a lot of jobs available, but there's a lot of jobs that are filled by talent that are expected to stay and they're keeping them and they're giving them the option to work from home, which, you know, contrary to, I think we've had an interesting time over the past year and a half. Many of you have received those emails if you're still, you know, uh, working, if you're lucky enough not to be working, maybe you don't know what I'm talking about. But over the last couple uh, year and a half, we received emails that said, we're going to have uh, people start coming back. And, you know, if it was January, they're going to say we're going to start having them come back in April. April comes, that get pushed out another three months. July comes, it gets pushed out another three months. And finally, more recently, a lot of places have just said, well, you know, we're going to give you the leisure to do what works for you. Um, there are some places who are starting to say they're going to have uh, people come back, but many places are just kind of on an indefinite work from home situation. And I feel like that's contributed to this strong labor market that we have. That being said, we do have weak consumer sentiment right now, as we should because of, well, first and foremost, the Russia-Ukraine conflict. I mean, I am, um, you can get a lot more on this info from on CNN. I am not the type of person to talk about all the different uh, angles of the Russia-Ukraine conflict. What I can talk about and what I love to talk about is how it's affecting the market. And we're going to get into all of that in a second. We've seen this huge surge in commodities across the board, and I'm talking um, anything from lumber to palladium to soybeans to corn to wheat, a, a ton of them. And it's as a result of a lot of different things. In the case of wheat, well, Russia and Ukraine export about 25% of the world's global supply of wheat. And that's why we've seen crazy moves in wheat. If for those of you who pay attention to any of those type of markets, uh, wheat, the actual commodity that trades was uh, about oh, 10 days ago, um, was up limit up in trading. And, and what that means is that it's, it can't arise above. The exchange has a limit for which it can rise above and it, and it hit that limit and it stayed there for majority um, of the day. And it did that for about four days in a row as a result of the, what is perceived to eventually be a lack of supply and a strong demand, right? So don't be surprised when your uh, loaf of bread ends up going to $4 soon just because of what we are seeing on the count of this Russia-Ukraine conflict. Um, but there's been a huge surge in commodities across the board. And the number one, of course, is oil, uh, which we're discussed in a minute. Uh, while it's receding some today and in the past week, we've seen the moves in oil. And obviously, we've really felt the pain at the pump as we've seen this huge just rise in oil prices and rise in gasoline prices as a result of um, interactions. Well, obviously, a lot of it has to do with the OPEC nations and obviously Russian is, is part of it. But it, to some degree, the U.S. is not as exposed to that. And I'll get to that in a little while, too. You'll see a chart on that. Um, but to be honest with you, a lot of the volatility started, if you can even remember, it seems like forever ago, but it really kind of started at the end of 2021, say around November or so, when the Fed pledged to attack inflation, obviously, which is one of the bigger themes in the market as well. Inflation is showing up in, in housing, in gas, and in food across the board. And so uh, starting in November, uh, Fed Chair Powell pledged that we were going to attack inflation. That was going to be the next big thing that we were going to get at because it is really um, sort of attacking our market and our economy in a lot of different ways. And guess what? We got Judgment Day coming up this week, folks. So the uh, Federal uh, Reserve um, Bank oh, Open Market Committee has their meeting this week. Many of you probably know this. Starting tomorrow and ending on Wednesday, at which a lot of people anticipate that they will be raising their rates. And for those who are not familiar, once the Fed, uh, the Fed uh, can control a lot of short-term rates, a lot of short-term rates that affect um, you know, re, uh, like money that you may have in a bank, if you, it'll be interesting to see how it's going to affect uh, CD rates uh, once again, and uh, it, it affects short-term rates on um, on credit cards and just a myriad of other things that it affects. So, the Fed's next move is really important, but they have an interesting task right now, given everything that's going on with the Russia-Ukraine conflict, given the, the surge in commodities and inflation. They have to be careful not to go too far too fast. 
Um, and that is the backdrop of which we're in right now currently, right? So we're going to look at a couple of different things. We're going to look at uh, equities, we're going to look at rates, and then we're going to look at volatility. And so starting off with equities, as we said already, equities versus commodities is the biggest theme that's been going on in the market uh, pretty much since since February, I would say. I mean, oil was beginning to rise at the end of last year and the beginning of this year, mostly in tandem with the 10-year yield. But Obviously, once this conflict hit, it took things to a whole new level. Now, as we said, it has backed off some. But nevertheless, when you look at uh, USO, which is an ETF that tracks oil, and you look at the SPIs, uh, the Qs, of course, is the NASDAQ ETF, and then IWM, which is the Russell 2000 ETF, so small stocks, small cap stocks, you can see that uh, they have really been, been hit hard just since the beginning of this year. So it's been an interesting thing to watch to some degree. Uh, you know, uh, small cap stocks have actually sort of outperformed a little bit. Um, well, no, I should say on only on the year long basis. But when we look at a further uh, longer term chart, um, well, this is the same type of chart. When we look at a percentage chart, you can see on a percentage basis that uh, the S and P five hundred and small caps are a little bit above tech stocks. Tech stocks have borne the brunt of the selling, which many of you are probably aware of over the past year. And a lot of it has to do with this rising rate environment. Um, as, as many of you might know, tech stocks are usually uh, been, have benefited from the potential for their future earnings. And when interest rates are going to change in the future, obviously that's going to drag them down. That's one of the main reasons why they have been affected largely. But I mean, look at this. I mean, this shows you right here, like oil is significantly outperforming the three major, uh, well, Dow's not on here, but just looking at those three indexes um, across the board, they've really been sort of hit hard over the past year, not uh, over the past, sorry, three months, mostly because of rising interest rates and then also this Russia-Ukraine conflict that's been going on. And so a lot of times you talk about the different compositions of the S&P 500. It's interesting to note that tech is 28% of the S&P 500 while energy is only 4%. So um, that's one of the main reasons why the S&P 500 is being dragged down because there's a, a large percentage of tech within it. And this, this has really changed a lot over the past maybe 15 years or so since I've been trading because energy was actually a larger percentage. We changed that after what happened in 2008. Well, I should say the market sort of corrected that in some degree because a lot of those names got got uh, you know sort of cut in half after 2008 when oil retreated at that point in time. And so it's odd. I mean, if energy were a higher percentage, uh, in, in all likelihood, the S&P 500 would probably be up a little bit more. But nevertheless, you can see this is attacking different areas of the market, whatever we're dealing with right now. S&P 500, which is very broad based, Russell 2000, um, which is a lot of small cap stocks and obviously tech stocks. So this is you know everything that's going on in a nutshell just in the past three months. This is a ratio of tech stocks, to, it's ratio of QQQ to SPY, but in other words, it's a ratio of tech stocks to the broad-based S&P 500. And so, um, as you would imagine, when S&P 500 is underperforming and Qs are outperforming, we get a higher uh, price point in this ratio, as you can see from the pre-COVID times until um, more recently on the tech top, but tech was largely outperforming, which we all kind of know, right? So you got to wonder, is was this a, a tech top? And again, there's a lot of you know, things, factors are contributing to this. I mean, we have a rising rate environment more recently, and, and that's really kind of um, been one of the bigger issues. And how much more are we going to get as far as interest rates, right? Like how many hikes are we going to get? The thought process is that we're going to get uh, at least six quarter point hikes, maybe even seven to get us uh, to somewhere around 1.25 or something like that. We'll, we'll, we'll see. 1.25% uh, that is, but we'll see. We really don't know. It's all a matter of how high inflation is in our environment, which it is really high. But then again, also how long um, is this conflict going to go on? Because it is in some regard affecting ourselves globally. Like a lot of the different things that we've done to sanction Russia, and we've definitely put them on an island and they deserve to be, um, but we've basically put them on an island in an economic way. And as a result of that, it's definitely hitting some areas of our markets too. Uh, John talked about how many people have 
um, equity stakes in some Russian stocks, uh, particularly like a, one of them is a Russian ETF, uh, RSX, which a lot of people know. There's a lot of people that have traded that not only with stocks, but options. And as of right now, it's just on a standstill. And so um, that kind of thing is, is sort of, uh, you know, not doesn't live in a vacuum. But nevertheless, we can see uh, tech stocks have really struggled uh, more so than the S&P 500. We saw that on the chart before. You can see it in here in another way. So um, it's not to say, you know, tech stocks are, are you want to completely stay away from tech stocks, but I think the speculative tech stocks that really emerged in the past uh, couple of years are the ones that are really sort of uh, tough to, to get into right now or even hold just because you don't know what their futures look like um, versus some of the top tech stocks, right? The, the, the well-known ones, FANG, is, if you will, the Facebook, the Apple, the, the Amazon, the Netflix, um, those type of stocks seem a little bit more safe but you know again uh, those are those are i think time will tell really what's going on with those so looking at commodities once again um if you've never seen a chart like this this shows you the uh different future um the different future prices for crude oil for example in this case we're looking at the forward uh futures curve for crude oil. And so you can see near the front, we're looking at April crude, and May crude, and June, if you will. And so this goes all the way out to December of 2027. And what you're looking at is a, is a, a situation which is known as backwardation in the futures market, meaning the front month futures are trading higher than the next month futures. And this is a true look at supply and demand in any futures market. And so like many other commodities right now, crude oil is considered to be in backwardation. And uh, backwardation can result as a, uh, can occur as a result of higher demand for an asset currently than the contracts maturing in the coming months throughout the futures market. And what this is saying is that every, uh, 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 you know, it's a easy, the easier way to say it is everybody wants oil right now um, because of what's going on. There's a fear that there's going to be low supply and lots of demand. And crude oil has been in backwardation like this for quite a few months, but there's other charts that do the same thing. If you look at soybeans, if you look at lumber, if you look at um, corn, a lot of commodities are in backwardation right now as a result of just the supply chain issues that we've had also over the past two years. So it's another interesting wrinkle in our market right now, having a lot of these commodities that are in backwardation and are in big time demand. So the interesting thing here is that we heard last week that the US and the UK were going to ban Russian oil, meaning we're not going to um, accept any of their Russian oil. We're, we're enacting an embargo on them, right? If you noticed, Germany was like, well, you know, we can't exactly do that. <laughs> and, and it's like, well, why not? Uh, well, this is why. Um, if this, is, this shows you the uh, Russian oil export partners in billions of dollars and the percent of uh, percent that it makes up of Russia's oil business. So for example, you got China um, that Russia exports about $23.8 billion worth of oil to, and that accounts for 38% of what they export. You have the Netherlands next at uh, $9.42 billion. And again, this is 13% of China. Uh, I'm sorry, 13% of what Russia exports to them overall, 13% of Russia's total. So you have the Netherlands, you have Germany, um, you have, as far as just European nations, Poland, Italy, you know, Finland in there as well. And so there's a lot of them that can't just say we're not going to accept Russian oil anymore, even though they would love to. It would really, you know, damage their economy to some degrees. I mean, 6.2 billion is, is no nothing to sneeze at for Germany. Whereas in our case, you know, it's about a billion dollars for the U.S. and about 1.1 for the U.K. And so I think that's why it made it an easy decision. Um, and then, of course, you know, with with China, we know there's a lot of ties between China and Russia, and that's probably one of the next things to worry about as far as if there's another shoe that eventually drops, right? Like any, um, you know, connection or any any sort of, uh, I guess, com combination of Russia and China together, I think, is one of the things that people are worried about. And, and as a matter of fact, as far as geopolitical stuff goes, uh, the China potentially invading Taiwan has been one of the things that has been keeping volatility uh, sort of um, elevated to some degree in these markets as well. Now, this is something where nobody, there's no, there's no uh, actual thing that's, that's talked of that's going to be happened, but we just never know. I think we're always looking for the next shoe to drop. And that's one of the things that people have sort of talked about, at least 
media has talked about anyway. But nevertheless, I don't I tend not to try to worry about things until they actually happen. And hopefully something like that does not happen. Of course, we felt the same way about Russia invading Ukraine. And lo and behold, that actually happened, which was kind of weird. Um, so that's where we are with, with equities, where we talked about. Obviously, we see what's going on with SPY, NAS, uh, S&P, NASDAQ and small cap stocks. And we see what's going on with commodities and commodities are really just um sort of running rampant right now. And that's really been what's been affecting, or I should say that along coupled with inflation is really what's having an issue on our market, which a lot of what we know, but it's good to see it in pictures. So now let's take a look at, at rates. Um, just a quick refresher for those who aren't uh, familiar with, with many of the rates or you're looking at, or don't trade rates too often, but this is a chart of the uh, 10-year bond note on the left and then the 10-year yield on the right. And so always remember that bond yields and bond prices move inversely. And if you could fixate your eyes on the January 2020 time period, right before we had the COVID pandemic, you can see that's where yields dropped off. People um, bought 10-year notes slash ZN. You can look that up at any given time. People bought 10-year year, um, bonds and uh, bond futures. And as a result of, you know, just out of a flight to quality, people were kind of fearful. And so obviously this pushes rates down. And that's why we had rates, not only that, but we also had the Fed, um, you know, taking action and basically taking interest rates very low to zero. Uh, basically, that was the two year rates, but, um, you know, 10 year yields uh, got knocked down as well as a result of the fear because people were piling into bonds um, because of the situation that we had. And you can see the climb back over the past uh, two years. And then you see um, at the beginning of this year or the end of last year and the beginning of this year, the, the idea that the Fed was going to eventually raise rates. Of course, that's going to push up the whole um, the whole rate curve, if you will, which we'll look at in a second. So this is just a reminder how those trade inversely. But mostly I'll be talking about uh, yields overall. So when I say bonds, I'm going to be referring to yields, if you will, as opposed to bond prices. So looking here, this is the yield curve. And so this is um, looking at uh, one year to 30 years, as far as looking at the yield curves, you can see how much this has changed just in a six month period. This is not even including the pandemic times, but if you look here, you can see uh, in October, you see where, where rates were. And if we can just like identify one, let's say the two-year rates, because that's probably moved the, had the most dramatic move here. But you can see two-year rates were somewhere around 0.25% in um, around October 12th, right? And as recently as last uh, you know, Thursday, you can see that they are just under, or at the time, they were just under 2%. So you can see the big change in, in two-year yields. And as again, that one of the, the reasons why is because um, the Fed, whatever moves that the Fed eventually makes affects short-term yields more than any other part of the curve. But the other parts of the curve do move to some degree, degree to reflect what's going on. And so a lot of people end up calling this what's the, the flattening of the curve. And you can see it. When you look at the darker lines, you can see this curve is elevated so much in the front and not as dramatically in the back. I mean, it has, but uh, when you look in relation to uh, how much a one-year yield has moved versus a 30-year yield has moved, you can see why they call this a flattening of the curve because the front part of the curve lifts up um, you know, more dramatically than the back part of the curve that you see. So there's been a real big change in yields. Um, and that's a result of the expectation for rate hikes. Like we talked about, people have discussed anywhere from, you know, five to seven rate hikes from the Fed over the course of the next year or so, which is, you know, quite dramatic. And of course, that 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 hits not only tech stocks, that hits your financials theoretically in a positive way. Um, and we've seen that move as well. But it, it, it affects all of our markets in a lot of different ways. And so that's one of the, the things that the market has been trying to digest. How many rate hikes are we going to get and what's expected? And based on this, you can see the two-year yield is the most sensitive uh, to rate hikes, potential rate hikes from the Fed. And that's why we see it somewhere around that 1.6, 1.7 range. Uh, just depends, you know, more in recent weeks, just depends on, on how traders feel in any given day. Um, but Again, it's moved a lot. And even within the past you know, two weeks, it's moved a lot because there's fear that the longer this, this conflict in Europe drags on, 
the Fed is going to have to really decide whether they're going to do larger rate hikes or smaller rate hikes um, overall. The, the consensus is they're going to still do one regardless because inflation is just that bad, which you know because you guys buy gas and you buy food and you buy and all these other things, right? So we're fully aware of it. So another way to look at this, this idea of rates is looking at just singular spreads compared to another. One of the favorites is looking at the difference between the 10-year yield and the two-year yield. And uh, this is sort of a favorite of, of economists because it kind of gives you an idea of what the market is anticipating with regard to the health of the economy. And so looking at it back in December of 2021, it was trading 82 basis points. And again, this is just taking the difference between where the 10-year yield is trading and the two-year yield. And the spread overall has been flattening since April. When we say flattening, that means the you know, near-term yield, in this case, the two-year yield, has been rising a lot more dramatically than the 10-year yield. So you can see from April of 2021, um, where it was at 1.6% down to uh, December, it was 82 basis points. And actually, we, we uh, for those of you who may have seen me the last time I was, I was on here with, with John and crew, uh, actually have this chart up. Now, this is where we are currently. We've dropped um, quite a bit. And um, as uh, one, again, one of the reasons why economists like this is because as it approaches zero, it can be a predictor of recession on the way. And um, once it does go below zero, the idea is that, or the thought process is that you usually show up in a recession within you know 12 to 18 months after this thing touches zero. And so one of the reasons why a lot of people are worried about this touching zero um, is not only because of recession, but it's, you know, the Fed can actually do something about this. If the Fed decides not to raise rates as uh, dramatically as we expect, then maybe we won't push ourselves into a recession. So again, as I just said, that's one of the things that people are fearful of. The Fed raising rates, even though we're in inflationary times, they could end up moving it too fast and push us into recession. That's, uh, you know, a whole different ball of wax to go from inflation to recession in, in a short time period. So uh, that's one of the worries so far as is a matter of what is the Fed going to do and how, how much are they going to raise rates in these next several meetings that we're going to be getting over time. The other interesting thing, to bring it back to equities real quick, this is a chart of the 10-year yield and IWM, which is a small cap um, stock ETF. Now, the interesting thing is, Going back to the pandemic times, 10-year yield and the IWM were basically moving together. One went up, the other went up, one went down, the other went down. And the idea there was that as we were recovering from what we dealt with in the pandemic, small cap stocks stood the best chance of, of recovering faster as the economy got better and as the 10-year yield started to rise again. Um, again, rates were next to, no, low, next to zero because the if Fed wanted to stimulate the economy so that we could get people out doing things again and buying. And obviously, I mean, you guys remember where it was. Thank God now COVID is, oh, it feels like it's um, almost a thing of the past. I mean, who knew that, you know, not to be funny, but who knew a conflict in Europe would create a situation where COVID would go away, but hopefully it stays away. But nevertheless, 10-year yield and small cap stocks moved together for quite some time. And then all of a sudden, as we got this interesting uh, you know, environment where we're going to start raising rates higher and this conflict has come, for whatever reason, small cap stocks have decoupled from the 10-year yield. And I'll be honest with you, this is one that I've just kind of noticed more recently. I'm not exactly sure why. It's still kind of strange, but uh, you know, there's certainly different ways to, to play it, whether or not they actually um, trade together again, I'm not sure. But one of the big things that we do at Tasty is we're often contrarians. Um, we, we, you know, and we, we don't, I guess, get too big and over convicted in any one idea. But when you see something that's, that's out of line, you sort of try to figure out what's going on, but you also make a play on it and make a trade on it. It, it almost seems as, as, as if this is something to get long as far as small cap stocks, just because this trend has held up for a better part of two years and all of a sudden it's trading. A lot of times they say this in trading and something works until it doesn't, any given one trade. Um, and this is decoupling. And this is something that I think requires some attention because it's kind of strange. Okay, let's get to volatility. Now, hopefully this is not the area where I lose some of you, but hopefully you stay with it because honestly, volatility is, is a fairly simple concept. 
It's no different than buying and selling a stock. You can buy and sell volatility. But I guess the question remains is, well, what is volatility? Well, you know, the thing about volatility, it's, you know, volatility is, um, oh, sorry about that. Volatility is one of the ways to, um, it's, it's basically how much, you know, stocks move in up or down in any given time period. And that volatility can be created um, or I should say be harnessed in looking at options. When you look at the implied volatility within a market, looking at implied volatility within the options market, that's showing you the current level where traders within that market are anticipating um, a stock to move any given percent up or down. And so, um, you know, one of the interesting things about volatility is that, is that it's mean reverting, meaning that once it it goes up and it usually, you know, takes what we call the elevator up because volatility usually goes high pretty fast, Right. And it's a result of something, you know, that is, is unanticipated. The market likes to know what's going on. Our economy is, is, is built on that type of idea. And anytime we have surprises, that's when high volatility kicks in. But as I'll show in a couple of charts here, volatility is often mean reverting. And once, once uh, usually one of the best ways to do that is determine is to just sell volatility, right? When, when we try to find different ways of selling volatility, once it gets a volatility pop, once it gets high, we try to harness that, that um, you know, opt, implied volatility that's high and hope that it comes back into a mean level, if you will. So how do you determine if volatility is high or low? Well, there's a lot of, of different ways of going about doing this. One of the best things about Tasty and that we have on our platform is that we have a calculation called implied volatility rank, which I'll show you later. And what we do is we take a look at, you know, every stock has that has options has implied volatility within those options. And implied volatility is, you know, this calculation that was created a long time ago uh, to give you an idea of how expensive or cheap something is. What we do is we take that implied volatility number that's currently happening and we compare it to the last past year in any given one stock or option. And we say this volatility is considered to be, you know, 100 percent higher than it was over the past year or right now it's only 20 percent higher. So that's fairly low. So I'll show you more of that in a little bit. But we essentially find ways to rank volatility based on how it's performed over the past year. And that's how we say something is necessarily high or low. And that's what how we would determine whether or not it's a good time to potentially buy it or a good time to potentially sell the options and the volatility. So I'll get some more of that in a little bit. But the big thing takeaway here as far as volatility, volatility just gives you an idea. What is volatility? It's movement with any given one stock. And the more it moves, the higher the volatility is, right? If you're, if you're buying a house, for example, and one day that house is you know, supposedly worth 250,000, then you come in the other day and it's worth 1.2 million, that there's a huge amount of volatility in the price of that one given house. How do you know what is the good bid to put in and buy the house? You, you really are not sure. Are you gonna meet in the middle somehow for some reason at 700K? What if it's not even worth that, right? So it'd be different though, if uh, you know the prices of that house and the house next door and the house behind it in that neighborhood, then you get a real idea of how much that house is actually worth. Or if you use something like a Zillow, right? And it shows you, Zillow is a funny example, given what they did this past year. But if for some reason, Zillow showed you the price of that house um, and where it ranks now versus the past year, then you get a real idea of how much that house actually costs and whether or not it's a good idea to buy it or maybe wait for a lower price. So that's kind of what we do. We try to create these rankings for implied volatility called implied volatility rank. And that's one of the ways we determine you're able to determine how volatility uh, works. Yeah, uh, you know, Jeff put in a question, volatility is a lack of liquidity. Yeah, you can see higher volatility in, in when there's a lack of liquidity too. It's, it's more than just that, but that's a good point, Jeff. It is, there are times where we see volatility due to a lack of liquidity. Um, one of the times we've seen lack of liquidity more recently has been in the overnight sessions more recently with futures. 
uh, on the, not this past Sunday when markets opened, but the previous two Sundays, we saw the markets drop a good bit because there was no volatility, or I should say there was no liquidity, and that created volatility in the market. So Jeff is correct. There are a lot of times uh, people associate a lack of liquidity with more volatility because that can't happen. That usually leads to um, a big movement in price. So again, volatility is, is just considered to be movement. And case in point, this is the day-to-day -day movement of the S&P 500 ETF, the SPIs, just in this past year. And you can see more recently, look at the big swings that we've had um, over the last couple of weeks. I mean, one day it's down 1%, one day it's up 2%, one day it's down 1%, one day it's one down 3%, down 1%, up 2%. I mean, you can see these are the type of movements that we have all been witnessing over the past couple of months. And you compare that to the beginning of January, and you start to get an idea of why volatility is so high right now, because we're this is the roller coaster that we've been on. Um, this is the kind of movement that we've seen over the last couple of weeks. And it leads to, to this. So for those who are unfamiliar with this chart, this is called the VIX. The VIX is the volatility index that's um, disseminated by the Chicago Board of Options Exchange, CBO, as, as John mentioned, I used to work there at one point in time. And this is their prized possession. The VIX is considered to be the fear gauge of the market. It usually lets you gives you an idea of, of how nervous investors are currently. And I've taken the liberty of highlighting a lot of different times just over the past two years. Um, you can see the peak at COVID-19 where the VIX was, was trading 80. And you can see, um, you know, again, in, in, in sort of that summer of that year, we got to, we were still sitting around the 40 level when it seemed like COVID was going away, but then it wasn't again. And so people got nervous. And, and if you remember what I said earlier, the market likes, um, does not like uncertainty. And anytime we have uncertainty, that's when we get these time periods where uh, we see big moves in the VIX. So anytime, um, to give you an idea, this dotted line here, is approximately around what's considered the long-term average of the VIX, which is considered to be 19. So anything that's above that is you know, a pop in the VIX and considered high. But as you notice, when VIX pops, it gets high, it eventually starts to go back down, right? And so that's what we talk about this idea of volatility being mean reverting. And this is one of the reasons why at Tasty, we like to try to be sellers of volatility when we get pops in the VIX, because we feel that the numbers are on our side with regard to volatility being mean reverting. So September of 2020 was a time period where after tech began to run up, we started to pull back some. And so people kind of figured like, oh, the tech overblown. It was this these fears of, of tech rising too far, too fast. Little did we know it was not quite there just yet. We had the election of 2020, which there was a high amount of volatility. It was pushing, VIX was pushing near 30 at that time period. And we had uh, the beginning of 2021, which saw the meme time period, if you remember the GameStop and AMC discussion, it was all over the place. I'm sure many of you heard about it. Then we had some fairly quiet times throughout the past year. I mean, we had an, an, another near pop near 30, but not too many until Omicron hit in December of uh, no, late November, December of, of last year. And that's when we got another pop again in volatility. So anytime you start seeing VIX around the 30 level, it it's really makes you, your ears perk up because you're like, okay, this is fairly elevated. And again, it's always hard to determine where volatility is going next because again the market doesn't like uncertainty and that's what creates these pops in the vix but you don't know when uncertainty is arriving right so just because it's 30 doesn't mean it can't go to 40 or 50 but there's a good chance that it's when, when it's at 30 it shouldn't mean revert to 20 but we just don't know when and how long um sometimes it's quick like we saw with omicron we saw the quick pop and then it went right back down and you know, sometimes it takes longer, like we saw in COVID. I mean, uh, from from 80 to to 30 looks, you know, took about two months. Um, that's quite some time. So it's just a matter of of the situation that we're dealing with. So more recently, we see we have the rate hike fears. And then we see where we are now. It touched, had a closing high of about 37 last Tuesday, I think it was, or Wednesday. And uh, since then, we've still been sitting around the 30s level. So the other interesting thing about the VIX that is a uh, quick, uh, you know, back of the, uh, uh, the, or I should say a post-it um, kind of thing to do is when this, uh, again, this is, this is the idea of a distribution and I mean distribution uh, is the VIX. And so when the other way to think about it is the rule of 16. And so um, you can, the VIX is sort of a annual number and you can make it into a daily number just by 
dividing it by the square root of the trading days in a year. So that's 252. So let's just say for intents and purposes, the square root of 252 is 1580.87 or something like that. We just say 16. So when you take the VIX number, let's just say, for example, it's the VIX is trading 32 and you divide it by 16, that is two. And so what that is saying is that the VIX is anticipating that the S&P 500 will move up or down 2% in any given day over the next 30 days. Um, because the VIX is a 30-day measure of volatility on the S&P 500 index. It uses that broad-based index. Um, again, you know, S&P is very broad-based with a lot, of different uh, a lot of different industries. And so the VIX is based off of the S&P 500. So a lot of times people will see the VIX trading 32 and say, oh, it's forecasting that over the next 30 days, we're going to get uh, up and down movements sort of like this for 2% in any given direction over the next 30 days. So that's how a lot of people also interpret the VIX. So it's another way to look at it. Or you could just remember to yourself that, hey, the long-term average is 19. If it's above 30, that's that's 11 points above average. That's, that's fairly elevated. So it's another way to think about it. So as I just said a second ago, VIX is derived off of the S&P 500. In this case, we're looking at SPIs. And you can see 79% of the time, the SPY and the VIX will move in opposite directions. Um, and that's where a lot of people derive this idea from. But the thing is, is um, it's, it's not just a situation of, oh, the, the S&P 500 goes down, so the VIX should go up. It doesn't quite work like that. You know, because of the way the calculation is based and because of what it's based off of, you really need um, the situation for the S&P to move certain percentages in any given one day to get a move out of the VIX. So my case is, my point is, if the VIX is 32, and like we just said, that's forecasting 2% moves in either direction over the next 30 days. If for some reason, the, the SPY is only moving 1% in any given direction, then it's actually underperforming what the VIX says it's going to do. And that will result in a situation where the VIX should start to come down because for whatever. Now, this also will all coincide with like, say, for example, right now, the VIX is trading 32. And we hear that the Russia-Ukraine situation is dying down. You're going to see the VIX move up, right? Um, I mean, I'm sorry, you're going to see the spies move up because the conflict is kind of over. That's been the thing that's weighing down the market. The VIX is going to start to come in. They're going to get that mean reverting situation for volatility because the, con the, the the uncertainness is over. Now we're getting some certainty behind what's going on in the market. And that's kind of how it works. A lot of people will see, you know, like I said, the spies down and the, the VIX down and they're like, okay, something's wrong. Whereas the VIX broken. And it's, it's really all based off of the calculation and how it's moved. So what I'm saying here is understand that the VIX is forecasting certain percentage moves and it needs to at least the SPY needs to at least reach those moves in either direction to get the VIX to budge as well. So here's another interesting chart uh, looking at the same, same type thing. And hopefully this is not too deep, but now we're looking at the VIX, right? And when you subtract the VIX from HV, which is historical volatility. So again, VIX is sort of what's considered the volatility of the S&P 500. And historical volatility is just how much the, um, in this case, the historical volatility for the S&P 500, how much it's actually moving over a given time period. So you have the forecasted move over the next 30 days, and then you have how much it's actually moved over the previous 30 days. When you subtract those, you get an interesting look at volatility overall. So when we see September of 2020, we see the tech overblown fears. We see it was high at uh, above 15 in this for this this metric that we're looking at here. And then we saw it trail off, right? We saw it start to drop off. So this gets back to that mean reverting quality. So we see the election of 2020, we know how high volatility was there. And then we see volatility dropped off because the VIX dropped off. We see the meme time period. We see this thing was very elevated and see we vol then volatility dropped off. We see the same thing with Omicron. We see the same thing with rate hike fears. There's where we are now. Is it going to go higher above 15? Is it going to drop back off back towards five or close to zero? Uh, these are the things that we're waiting on. How would we get a number close to zero? That could be where VIX is trading, let's say 14 or 13, um, which is fairly low. That's below that long-term average of 19, right? And say historical vol, 
that is trading around 13 as well. That's how you get a number of zero. So um, that though, these are things to kind of look at and get an idea of where we expect VIX to sort of mean revert and eventually come in. But right now, as you can see, it's, it's been ascending and we don't know, this is all because we don't know what's coming next as far as inflation, as far as the rate hikes, or as far as the European conflict. So guess what? We're back to the idea of backwardation again. We saw this in commodities and we're seeing this in VIX as well. And the reason why is because, like I said, when you think about backwardation, it's it's people are want something now um, versus the, what they'll want. The, they'll want it less in a few months. Volatility is high right now because of currently what's going on. And we still expect it to be somewhat elevated though. When you look at November of 2022, I mean, 27 is not a low number. Again, when you think about the long-term average of 19, 27 is still fairly high. So that's how spooked this current conflict and inflation and um, you know the, the idea of what the Fed's gonna do with interest rates, that's how spooked all of this has the entire market. The VIX curve is in, in backwardation. And this is, you know, backwardation is fairly uncommon. Um, how uncommon is it? Well, we have a current backwardation streak right now of 19 straight days. And that's very unusual. Um, to be honest with you, back, the market is, the VIX market is in backwardation less than a third of the time. Um, and so to see it not only in backwardation, but in a, an extended backwardation streak is, is pretty rare. As you can see at the top here, from August of 2011 to September, I'm sorry, to November of 2011, that was the debt ceiling time period. And the market was fairly spooked um, because they just didn't know how it was going to affect uh, the economy. And so for 76 straight days, we were in backwardation. Next, and, and, and uh, throughout this list is that time period of the global financial crisis, um, September 12th time period around the time um, where, you know, we were obviously dealing with a lot. We had already lost one bank. We were losing another. And so from September to December of 2008, that was a 63 straight day period where the VIX was elevated. Volatility was high because we had a lot of movement in the market, as you guys you know remember. February 24th of 2020 to May 6th of 2020, of course, is the pandemic. And we had 52 straight days. So each one of these has a story. <laughs> I mean, is really what, what the point is here. And so it's interesting right now we're in a 19 day period and currently it ranks uh, ninth all time as far as the streak. So really this is definitely quite an opportunity for all of us in the market right now. It creates opportunity to sell volatility. It creates opportunity to buy stocks. I think our key for all of us is that we don't have, we can't, we don't want to jump in with both feet, but we definitely want to do something because this is an incredible opportunity in the market. However you trade. So one last thing on the VIX. I talked about uh, us at Tasty Works we're, and, and Tasty Trade. We're, we're often volatility sellers because we wait for times for the VIX to pop, and then um, you know, or or on not only the VIX to pop, but also pop the volatility to get high in any one given um, equity name, and then we look to sell volatility in a myriad of different ways. But one of the interesting things you can do with your portfolio is whatever money you're allocating towards um, options, you can do it in a, in a way based on the VIX levels currently. And so let's say you have, um, you know, I don't know, let's say you have 100K in buying power that you want to use um, towards options. And right now the VIX is, is at 30, right? So it's between 30 and 40. So that would mean you're going to be using 40,000 just in options alone and to sell. Um, based on that. And what this does really is it protects us because um, looking at those charts that we saw earlier, sure, VIX could be at 30 and it could be a massive selling opportunity. But what we what we don't know um, is that something else, another shoe is going to drop and say China does invade Taiwan for whatever reason, VIX is definitely going a lot higher at that point. And you know, once you're in and you're selling volatility, you can obviously um, you know overextend yourself in some type of way. So we have this sort of VIX level versus max allocation buying power chart to sort of give, uh, it, it's sort of a marker and it gives you an idea of how to trade short volatility without sort of hamstringing yourself. So capital allocation should also scale with market implied volatility, meaning the VIX. So if the VIX is 15 to 20, you're only using 30% of your buying power. If for some reason the VIX rises higher, now it gives you an opportunity to say, I'm gonna use 40% of my buying power 
um, because I think this is that much more of a credible opportunity. And so that's kind of how we, we view the market. Then what you want to do is just scale back in low impo- implied volatility markets when the implied volatility does come in, when the VIX does come in overall. And, and, and it's basically one and the same. Once the VIX sort of comes in from like 40 to 20, implied volatility of any options that you are trading or that you're short, those are also going to come in because the uncertainty is sort of sucked out of the market. And that's one of the reasons why we're interested in selling because that way you can reap the benefits of those options, um, you know, that the volatility or the value of those options coming in or getting smaller and you're able to sort of buy those back. So the idea here is you scale up or scale down um, with your trading in the market based on the VIX level. And uh, I can provide this chart to you at any given time or um, however you, you want to see it. So our takeaways here before we start looking at a few ideas is we're in an unusual and complicated trading environment. Commodities and energy are outperforming equities in a massive way right now. I, I, you know, who knows how long that, that goes on. Again, we've seen oil coming in today. Is this, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a lot of it has to do with inflation. And then on top of that with oil, you know, there's the global situation. Obviously, it, it's, a, it's a global benchmark for a lot of different things. It's not just West Texas crude oil, but there's also Brent oil that's being affected by the conflict as well. Um, is it a little, was it a little, a little out of whack? I mean, it seems like it was if oil is trading $130 and, you know, again, but I mean, who am I to know? Um, I just pay attention to price action really is what I like to do. Near-term rates are rising faster than long-term. It's something that uh, there's not a whole lot we can do about. Uh, we're, we're trying to stem inflation overall in our economy, and that's what the Fed's job is. So is, are they going to rise, uh, or I should say, um, you know, raise rates faster than we anticipate? Are we going to get a 25 basis point hike this week? Are we going to get a 50 basis point hike this week? Those are the real discussions there. And nobody really knows um, anybody who tells you they do. They're lying right now because you just don't know uh, how this is going, how this conflict in, in, in Europe is going to affect how the, the Fed is going to raise rates. We'll really see what happens. We have a very atypical high volatility environment. We talk about this backwardation in the VIX. It's very atypical. Like I said, less than a third of the time we're in backwardation. And we're not only in backwardation right now, but we're on a long-term streak that's in the top 10. So it's really creating some, some really good setups overall for short volatility. Now, what we usually try to do is, um, you know, it, this, this gets to however your, your risk appetite works. So we usually try to do uh, defined risk options, but uh, selling opportunities, but there's plenty of different ways to do it. You can do some that are, are undefined. Those are a lot more risky, um, but it's also a matter of, of uh, your risk tolerance here. And we can um, get more into that in a second. So before I show you the platform, as John said, I do have a show on our network. It's called Engineering the Trade. It's kind of a play on, on my, my former career. Um, I'm on every day from one uh, at 1.30 uh, to uh, 1.30 to 2 Central Time or 2.30 to 3 Eastern Time on the Taste of Trade Network. Give my views very similar to what we just uh, experienced here and, and talk about what's going on in the markets and um, as you would imagine, things have been fairly busy recently, but uh, yeah, if you, if you ever want to check out the show and, and see what you, you think about it. So let's take a look at um, uh, the platform here and see if we can find a few things that might be interesting. Um, let's see. Okay, so where are we right now? Ooh, it looks like we're, we're getting towards lows of the day here. So once again, the market's a, a little... Um, sort of uh, tra- trading on lows. The interesting thing about today that I've noticed so far in the little bit of time that I've been looking at the market um, this morning is that in the in the past couple of weeks, when the market was trading down like this off of its highs, um, usually oil would be trading above a certain level. So you can see on my left side here, we have the, um, I look at the micros a lot. These are interesting, um, you know, m- uh, micro futures. So the micro ES is the um, micro S&P 500 future. And then there's the uh, micro NASDAQ future, and then there's the micro Russell 2000 future. So um, a lot of what I've talked about earlier, where it's talking about the SPIs, Qs, and IWM, I also look at uh, the future for those because we've been trading. There's, there's so much been going on that it's actually a decent time to trade the futures because we're beginning movement outside of market hours as well. Uh, we talk about yields at the uh, small exchange, which is another partner of ours. Uh, we look, I look at a lot of their uh, yield product. So you can see the slash S2Y H22. That's the March two-year yield. 
in that's trading, you know, it's just similar to what um, it's just 10 times the side of, of what the actual two-year yield is trading. So in this case, where it says 18.15, the two-year yield is trading 1.81%. Um, this would be 2.1% for the 10-year yield and then 2.45% for the 30-year yield. So just looking at that curve. Um, they also have a dollar product that you can trade. The asset slash SFX is the dollar equivalent of, uh, the well, the smallest equivalent of the dollar trading the, the US dollar. We see volatility here. We talk about backwardation, the slash VX H22 and the slash VX J22. Those are the VIX futures. And so when you see 30.7, that is March and April is trading 30.5. So like we said, the near term month is trading higher than the next term month. That tells you the idea of the backwardation that we're talking about. I look at uh, crude oil via the slash MCL, which is the um, crude oil product. So I always go through and look at what's going on in the market via this way and looking at different things. But before my time runs out, let me show you um, just a couple of things you could do as far as trading options real quick. One of the things um, looking at our platform, you can look at uh, market indices here in the Dow Jones Industrial Average. I'm sure many of you look at the Dow. One of the great things about it, like right, right now, we're saying volatility is high. So you can look at um, you know a lot of these different symbols and look at volatility in those. So looking at Apple, if we look at uh, April options, which is 31 days, we usually look for options that are trading anywhere between um, 21 and 45 days as far as selling. Our research at Tasty and our research team has showed us that that's an optimal time to trade options as far as from the selling perspective, because that's when you can get the most out of um, those options decaying in value. So if you're looking at Apple, for example, we often like to look at the 30 Delta option. If you were to sell this 145 put option, you can see Apple stock is trading 152.51. If you were to sell this 145 put option for $3.85, or in this case, let's say, yeah, it's mid-market. So $3.80, you see the market is $3.80 at $3.90. If we're selling $3.85, that's the mid-market. At least it was for a second, as you can see. But um, Aside from the price for a second, a lot of things I want to point out. Stock is trading 152.37. See that IV rank right there in the top left-hand corner? That is ranking the implied volatility currently in Apple, which as you can see, the implied volatility we can also look at. So this is the implied volatility that is uh, specific to Apple. If you look at the 145 puts, you see the implied volatility here is 39.27. That, that, that is something you can compare. You could look at that in a lot of different volatility charts if you wanted to um, across time, or you can just look at this implied volatility rank and it's showing you that it's 83.2. That is fairly high um, when it's very high as a matter of fact. And so when Im implied volatility is that high, that's when you look to sell it. And if you sell this put, this is saying that um, you could potentially be obligated to buy stock at one point in time. Selling a put is a strategy that if your option goes in the money and the way this option would go in the money is if the stock is trading below 145. And if you're selling this put, you're saying I would be, um, you know, somebody could eventually, it would obligate you to buy stock at a 145 at in April of expiration, could potentially, right? Now, it all depends on how you look at it. Would you be comfortable buying stock 145? Some people would, right? Or you could say, well, I don't want to do that. I'd be comfortable buying stock at 140. It's all a matter of how you look. Like I said, we often look at the 30 Delta option, as you can see Delta here. So that option was 32. Now we're looking at the 23. It's just a matter of how you feel about that specific option or whether you want to do it or not. Um, what strategy for high volatility if you cannot short in your account? You know, that's the tough part about it. If you can't short volatility, I mean, you might not be able to do, you, I wonder, I'm not sure of your brokerage, you'd have to check with them. There's other ways to do it. You could sell this put outright and you're basically using, if you have a margin account, as you can see, the the see this buying power over here in the far right-hand corner where my cursor is, $1,800. That is about 20% of the buying power based on a margin account. If you were actually, if you don't have a margin account, you would have to sell this put um, and be able to buy 100 shares of the stock, which in this case at $140 would be $14,000. So there's there's not too many ways you can short volatility if you can't short um, in your account. There's, there's very limited in the actions. Sorry, I'm not sure about that. But there you go. You can do cash secured puts. And, and I think a lot of people should be able to do it. But um, well, one last chart before we go. One last question. The chart about the capital allocation, according to the VIX level, does it assume portfolio of margin is used? Um, it does not. No, it's just a matter of 
however you view your account. Cause again, it's in percentages. So um, you want to do 40% when the VIX is between 30 and 40, that's just a percentage of your account, however you want to do it. But case in point, you can look at a lot of different Dow names right now that a lot of us would necessarily think are normally higher because the market has trended down so much. You can look to sell puts in those accounts, or you can sell defined risk opportunities, meaning selling the 140 put and buying a $10 wide, uh, selling a $10 wide put spread. So those are other ways, but um, that's my time for now. Okay, Jamal, that was great. Thank you very much. Very sure. educational. Um, and we'd love to have you back again in the future. Absolutely, my friend. Thank you so much.